in the movies, let's see if we can get this to work, um, in film and television we have powerful personal assistants that understand every word that we say, 2001, Star Trek, her, and so forth. In the real world, right now, what we really have is not powerful assistants that understand everything that we say. Instead, we have hype. Hype is ubiquitous right now in the AI world. I'm going to give you some examples about where it comes from and how we should have a realistic view of AI. So um, here's an example of where hype starts. A corporation with a lot of money invested in AI puts out a press release, a blog, and says, Microsoft <coughs> excuse me, creates AI that can <coughs> read a document and answer questions about it, as well as a person. And it's not really true. The system has not really learned as well as a person. I'll explain that in a minute. But the media gets very excited about this, and they turn that into something even more um, exciting. They say computers are getting better than humans at reading. Well, Microsoft never said that. And Microsoft also didn't say that robots can now read better than humans. There weren't any robots involved in the study that Microsoft was talking about. And then they go on to say millions of jobs are at risk. How many people have seen headlines before about millions of jobs at risk? Right? You see them all the time. Um, but it comes from things like this, this study that are wildly <coughs> overinterpreted. So if you read the fine print here, what happened is that Microsoft got a score of 82.6 on a test that humans got a score of 82.3 or something like that. So they didn't actually beat humans by a statistically significant amount. They just barely beat the humans at all. And they weren't beating Gary Kasparov, who was the world's greatest chess player when Deep Blue um, beat Kasparov. No, they were beating people who work for $9 an hour on Amazon Turk, going through as many stories as they possibly could. So it wasn't really the test of, of the world's greatest humans. But more than that, it wasn't really a very good <coughs> test of reading. So. Um, what you had to do in this reading test was to underline a couple of words to identify the answer to question. So you could only answer things that are directly answered in the text. So if you had a short story like two children, Chloe and Alexander, my favorite children in the world, um, went for a walk and they both saw a dog in a tree and Alexander saw a cat, the system like this could answer who went for a walk because the answer is there in the text. But anything else would be out of bounds. So the system was never asked anything like, are Chloe and Alexander people? So when you read, a lot of what you do is you read between the lines. You figure out the, <coughs> the obvious things that authors don't have to tell you. Um, is it Alexander more than 100 years old? Well, if he's a child, obviously not. You can figure out all of this stuff. Machine reading can't do any of that. So you have these big, giant headlines that say, you know, humans are going to be replaced. In reality, the machines can't really do anything. Mm, thank you. So I, um, I saw that there was going to be another press apocalypse. And I tweeted about it, and I said, prepare yourself for a batch of grossly misleading reports on machine reading today. And four days later, clearly Sundar um, Pichai had not read my um, little bit of caution. He went and said that AI is more profound than electricity and fire. This is the kind of hype that we see right now. Well, maybe someday it will be. Right now, it's clearly not anything like that. But there are lots of people going around that. Here's Andrew Eng. Um, who's one of the most well-known people in machine learning, saying AI can do anything that a person can do in a second. Well, is that really true? Well, AI can do some things that a person can do in a second. AI can, for example, look at this picture and decide that it is more likely to be Tiger Woods than a golf ball. So AI can actually do that. It can do it pretty well now. Um, and the general way it does that is it takes big data in and it forms statistical approximations using a technique called deep learning. And deep learning is actually really good at a bunch of things. And so it's gotten popular for a reason. It's a really powerful technique, but it's not nearly as powerful as people believe. So it's good at object recognition. It's good at face recognition. So this is how Facebook <coughs> automatically tags your photos. It's good at speech recognition, at recognizing patterns in board games. It's getting good at telling the difference between a tumor or not. A lot of perceptual things. <coughs> but the truth is, nonetheless, that we're still a long way from what you might call strong artificial intelligence. And I've been making this point for a couple of years now. People send me things by Twitter, um, examples of this. So here's one. You say to Siri, hey, Siri, find <coughs> excuse me, a fast food restaurant that's not McDonald's. And what does Siri come back with? Four examples of, or three examples of McDonald's. And I don't mean to pick on Siri. You get the same thing out of Google. Someone else sent me this. Don't give me the results of the last 49ers game. And of course, what does Google come up with of the last 49ers game? So you think about the Star Trek computer. The Star Trek computer did something like this. 
you would be, you'd be like Captain Kirk says to Scotty, what is wrong with the computer? Go fix it. But this is what we actually have right <coughs> now. Now, a lot of people might remember Rosie the, <coughs> excuse me, Rosie the Robot from the old cartoon. Um, Rosie the Robot would be the greatest thing for parents ever. Could change diapers, cook dinner, and so forth. I would pay a significant amount of money for something like this. What we actually have is Roomba, which is a little hockey puck that skates around a room um, and picks up a little bit of dust, but certainly can't do anything like diaper changing. So I'm here today, obviously, to give you a, a dose of <coughs> realism. Um, I wrote an article in January called Deep Learning, a Critical Appraisal. Um, on Archive, you can get it for free, A-R-X-I-V. And I talked about 10 problems for deep learning. I can't go through all of them in the next few minutes, but I want to give you some of the gist. Um, somebody else actually summarized for Wired <coughs> a lot of them in this handy-to-remember headline, Greedy, Brittle, Opaque, and Shallow, The Downsides to Deep Learning. And I'm going to give you a few lessons about deep learning because it's so popular and so ubiquitous in all the discussion right now about AI and how much we should invest in it and so forth. So <coughs> the first lesson is simply this, that deep learning is not magic. It often looks magic, but it looks magic when we see a small amount of data, when we see a few examples. So we see something like this. The system labels a few, uh, a few pictures, and you're like, wow. So what's the one on the left? It's a person riding a motorcycle um, on a dirt road. We're amazed that the machine can do it. And then we see another one, and the machine says, a group of young people playing <coughs> a game of Frisbee. And we're like, OK, I guess AI has finally arrived. But if you look in the fine print, there are always a lot of examples like this one, which reminds me of Oliver Sacks' Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, if you ever read that classic book. So you show this to the system, and you, the answer, this is a parking sign with stickers, um, for those of you who might be robots and can't tell. Um, to an AI system, it's a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Um, here's another example. What does this look like to you? Maybe a pattern of yellow and black stripes. If you're trained on ImageNet, which is the common um, system that people have been using for machine learning, um, you answer that it's a school bus. Or how about this one? You see this, a bunch of dots. But to the machine, <coughs> it's a digital clock. Um, deep learning works best in what you might call the regime of big data. If you have lots and lots of training examples, it can work really, really well. Um, if you have things that are routine and are similar to the rest of your data, it works really well. You move out of that, <coughs> and it doesn't work so well. So if you have a lot of pictures of kids playing Frisbee, that's easy. There aren't a lot of pictures of parking signs with stickers. That's hard. Um, and nowadays, there's a whole field called adversarial examples, where people have shown many different ways in which you can fool these systems. So the picture on the top is obviously a banana. The, um, the picture on the left is like a psychedelic decal of a toaster. You take that psychedelic toaster picture and put it next to a banana and ask a deep learning system, what do you see? <coughs> it will say toaster. Now, any human being would say, that's not really a toaster. It's like a picture of a toaster next to a banana or something like that. But these systems can't even express complicated ideas like that. They're very easily fooled. <coughs> so the third point about deep learning is that its gifts at perceptual classification which is really what it does well, can only take you so far. So you go back to all of the things that I talked about before, object recognition, face recognition, speech recognition, and so forth. Um, and they're all examples of putting things in perceptual categories. I have 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 examples of things that belong to 10 or 100 or 1,000 categories. And I say, these are new ones. Are they like <coughs> the others? And that's great. But there are lots of things that don't fall into that. Even in vision, there are lots of things that don't. So you could use a perceptual classifier like deep learning to identify um, that there's a dog in this picture if the system's not too thrown by the ears being splayed out, and that there's a <coughs> barbell excuse me, in the picture. But no deep learning system is going to say, hey, that's really weird. How did the dog get to be so strong, so ripped, that it could actually lift a barbell? Right? You, as a human being, see a complicated scene here and understand <coughs> the relation between the parts. And the systems don't. Um, <coughs> so here's this quote from Andrew Eng. If a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI either now or in the near future. And here's, I think, something more realistic for anybody who's actually working with deep learning, wants to know where the systems work and where they don't. Which is, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought and we can gather an enormous amount of 
directly relevant data, we have a fighting chance, so long as the test data aren't too terribly different from the training data and the domain doesn't change too much over time. If anything changes over time, it doesn't work that well. Well, that brings me to Go. <coughs> Go is exactly in the sweet spot of what deep learning can do um, because the data never change. The, the rules of Go haven't changed in 2,500 years, and so that's actually something where you can collect a lot of data. But let's compare Go and life. So Go is highly complex. You have perfect information about the board state. It can be simulated perfectly. You have unlimited data. All that really matters is the state of the board at that moment. But what about life? Well, life is also highly complex. There are some things that are in common, <coughs> but, <coughs> but you have imperfect information. You can't simulate it perfectly. You have only a little bit of amount of data for each task, and essentially anything can matter. So Go is not really anything like life at all. <coughs> the things that we think about for general intelligence, none of them are actually captured there. So general intelligence, you have to be able to transfer between different problems. You have to learn from verbal explanation, from small amounts of data, from imperfect information, and so forth. Just because we made progress on Go doesn't mean that we've made progress towards general intelligence. And really, we've all seen this movie before, but everybody seems to have forgot. So Watson won in Jeopardy, and everybody was like, wow, I guess AI is solved, and you know, IBM had a big marketing campaign around it. But it hasn't really worked out so far. So Watson is like seven years ago now, and it still hasn't, for example, made the progress on cancer that was promised. Um, so recently, for example, the MD Anderson Cancer Center decided to pull out of a contract with Watson because the AI wasn't strong enough yet. So a lot of what we want to do remains out of reach. There's some things we can do, like speech recognition, image recognition, we're pretty solid on. But there are other things like conversational interfaces that have basically been a failure. Facebook, for example, had its M project that was supposed to be a universal um, personal assistant that you could talk to as a chatbot, and they canceled the project because it's just too hard. We haven't gotten towards automated scientific discovery, automatic medical diagnosis only a little bit. Um, <coughs> do most domestic robots are a long way away. One way to think about it is that ultimately deep learning is just one tool um, and we're actually going to need lots of tools. So deep learning is like a better hammer, um, but we need a whole kit of tools. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, one way of thinking about it is that um, to a man who has a hammer, everything is a nail. And that's kind of what's happening in the field right now is that people are saying, I've got deep learning, it's really good at one kind of problem, I think I'm going to be able to solve all of AI that way. And it's just not plausible. To a psychologist, and that's really my training, I work with Steven Pinker, um, you can think that in cognition there are many different things that are going on. We have perception, we have language, we have reasoning, we have common sense. Deep learning is really just one piece of that. It's the perceptual piece um, <coughs> of cognition. There are other things that happen too. For example, we have common sense. So you can imagine a robot sitting on a tree limb tr um, trying to cut down the tree. If it sits on the wrong side, it's going to fall down and kill the people below. You can't learn that <coughs> the way that we learn things in machine learning right now. Because the way we learn things in machine learning is you try things a million times, make a lot of mistakes, and you find out. Well, you can't cut, cut down a million tree limbs and kill a million people uh, standing below. Um, I have these slides to show um, some other examples of common sense. Um, but instead, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to skip the slides and tell you about an example that I learned about backstage. So we'll just ignore these. Um, well, I'll, I'll show you this one, and then I'll, I'll give you one example. So common sense is that you can learn what something like this is on one trial. I tell you that this is a yarn feeder, and immediately you can look at it and start to understand what it is, and you can recognize other versions even if they are absolutely but ugly, as this one is. Right? So you, you look at this and you still know it's a yarn feeder. It doesn't share any pixels with the other one, but you understand what the concept is. And so if I show you a whole set of them, for example, you can recognize them all. So the beautiful example I heard of backstage is what if you take a Roomba, which is a little hockey puck that goes around and does vacuum cleaner, and it doesn't have any common sense about what feces are. And you have a dog who has an accident inside the house. Well, apparently somebody actually documented this on YouTube, and they called it the poopocalypse. Um, so that's what happens with a robot that has no common sense. And unfortunately, deep learning is not getting us to the solution to that particular smelly problem. So what I wrote in 2012, um, and the time is, is relevant here, is I said, look, this is when deep learning first came on the scene. Deep learning is part of the larger challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships. They're likely to <coughs> face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and there's still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. Well, people's enthusiasm about deep learning has grown enormously 
in the last six years. And the amount of commercial applications has grown enormously. But I put it to you that there's been no progress on any of the things that I'm raising here. And finally, some people in deep learning are kind of starting to recognize that. This is Jeff Hinton, who is kind of the father of deep learning. And he said last August in an interview, we need maybe to start over. So I, I think he's right, and we can't put all of our eggs in this basket about what I do with a large amount of data with these giant neural networks in the system called deep learning. So I want to suggest a different paradigm. So deep learning is all about memorizing training data, having lots and lots of examples. Well, humans do things differently. We learn through exploration, through problem solving, and an intuitive understanding about how the world works. So here is uh, my daughter Chloe last summer, and she sees this chair, and she sees that there's a gap between the bottom of the chair and the top of the chair, like all the chairs out here in the audience. And she decides, not because she's seen 10 million examples, not because she's going to get paid for doing experiments, but just because it's fun, she decides, wonder if I could stick my body through the aperture between the back of the chair and, and the, the bottom of the chair. And so she went and did that. And I did not um, have the presence of mind to record it the first time, but I got her to do it a second time. This is kind of a reenactment that I was able to um, tape. So this is the second time that she's ever done this. So she looks at the chair, and then she kind of susses it out, and she does <coughs> what I <coughs> call intuitive physics. She figures out the size of the aperture, the shape of her own body, what she can do, and she maneuvers in it. And then she does a little bit of problem solving because she gets stuck. Her arm doesn't fit through, but she doesn't need a million trials. She rotates her body, and she figures out how to get out. We don't have robots that are anywhere near that flexible. Um, in fact, here, here's a video some of you may have seen. Um, I'm going to show you a video from a DARPA competition where everything was <coughs> done in simulation. All the jobs were known in advance, and still all the world's best scientists came up with robots like these. So the lesson here is we've had robots, we've been working as a field on robots for 60 years. Artificial intelligence um, started in the 1950s. My daughter was only three years old when she climbed through the chair. And the point is maybe we can learn something um, from kids about how to make our robots smarter. So just to sum up, <coughs> deep learning is just one tool among many. It works best as a perceptual classifier. If what you need to do in your AI task for your business is just to decide are these things like these other things I saw before, Deep learning is a perfectly fine tool. <coughs> and if you have enough data, and if those data don't change over time. But deep learning is just a kind of statistic, and statistics, all statistics make assumptions. So standard statistics, for example, assume the data are normally distributed, if you know what that is. Well, deep learning, if its assumptions are not true, if the data change over time in different ways, it's not really a very good technique anymore. We haven't seen any reason to actually believe that it can solve problems like common sense or natural language understanding. If we want the field of AI to advance, if we want to get to the point where we can actually use AI to help solve cancer and um, <coughs> climate change and things like that, we need a more powerful system for AI. We're going to have to acknowledge that deep learning, even though it's very popular, is not actually getting us there. We're going to need some kind of new paradigm. Otherwise, I think we risk just getting stuck and kind of running up against a wall. And what I'm suggesting is maybe the minds of human toddlers, which I think are infinitely more flexible, might give us some pretty valuable hints. Thank you very much.